All right, we're recording, and I'm here with the fantastic Christine Daigle and the wonderful JP Reinflesh. Hey guys, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hello. I feel like I need some kind of like um, royal uh, celebratory music for both of you, but I don't have any. But some kind of like you know, bum 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 bum. I'm pretty sure that's the Darth Vader music, but okay. That was the Darth Vader music. Why did that come about? Was that sounds perfect. That's Let's kind of talk on about brand. that. The last time I was on a podcast with JP, I called it by the wrong name. And this time I introduced him with the Darth Vader music. So Imperial March for the win. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> uh, okay, so give us, uh, give everybody listening a couple um, sentences about yourself. And I will add details if you don't, if you don't say Wonderful. Like. Well, Christine is pointing at me. So I suppose I am the first one to go. Uh, I like to put myself as a tagline of the curator of things dark, strange, and queer. Uh, I like to write those things, and I like to read those things. Excellent tagline. I'm jealous of this tagline. Yeah, I don't have a tagline, so now I have to come up with something on the fly that sounds that good. So I don't know. I write sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. I like to write things that are quirky and fast-paced and often twisted. Nice. That's me. That's right. And you have several books out on the market, right? Yeah, I have two serials out on Kindle Bella. Yeah. So I have a sci-fi, The Molecule Thief, and I have a horror. Awesome. Uh, Dark is Away. And then, yeah, we had, um, so I have a co-author, Stuart, and we did those together. We have one trad pub book. Uh, awesome. It's a steampunk called Namro Key. So yeah, that's what I have out. That's awesome. And uh, JP, you're in an anthology or a couple anthologies. I'm in a couple anthologies with uh, Jay, a post-apoc one, a sci-fi one. Um, then I have a creepy horror one uh, that I co-wrote with uh, A.B. Cohen, who we are doing a series together, a six book series. We're on book nice. four right now. We don't have any out because we're holding back on you. And then we're working on a Kindle Villa together, you and I. You and I are doing a Kindle. We write nerds together, which is, mm-hmm. oh, I don't have my hat down here. I'm so mad. I got um, my stickers today. I got my merch. Did you really? That's I awesome. did. I got nerds. You are a bunch so of nerds. Excited. Yeah. yeah, I was so I've been wearing the hat everywhere. It's um my wife has actually asked me to stop wearing it so often. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so because I like it. I like it and I like the way that because all it says is nerds uh NRDS special agent underneath. And I I like the look that people give me when they're like trying to figure out if it's a real thing or not. They're like, is that a is that a real thing it is yeah, anyway um and then y'all are both the co-hosts of the serial uh fiction podcast which is two podcasts both for a reader and a writer which is one of the i listen to a ton of podcasts and that's one that i make time for every week so Thanks. i really love it um <laughs> and i love i'm just gonna pump your podcast here for a minute i think one of my favorite things about the reader side of the podcast you can go find it on i listen to it on spotify but it's it's everywhere it's everywhere it's everywhere um you uh one of the things i love about the reader podcast is that y'all actually have a voice actor read the first chapter first episode of everybody's serial which is fantastic i really love that yeah yeah we give our authors the choice between uh using one of our narrators or reading it themselves and sometimes they read it themselves and sometimes we get narrators so it's a cool kind of mix yeah i love it very cool. Uh, and that's why um, I asked you guys to come on because I wanted to just have a conversation about serial fiction. Um, and also, but before we do that, before we get into talking about serial fiction and how it changes writing, um, let's talk about Cleveland. So all three of us were in Cleveland this weekend we were. getting we certified. Were. I have my, do y'all have your challenge coin? I have my little challenge coin here. You Mine's little, upstairs. I, I could have it up. Mine's coins. upstairs. Mine's downstairs. Nice. I'm the only one. I'm the only one with the authentic challenge coin. They're both lying. I'm the only one that has one. I'm just kidding. Uh, so we um, we were in Cleveland. We we're getting certified as three story method editors. Three story mm-hmm. method is a book by Jay Thorne and Jack, Zach Bohannon, um, which I found out today you wrote a chapter. I of. wrote a little piece in it. They just asked me to talk a little bit about um, character wants and needs just because of my background in neuropsychology. So I was like, sure. That's awesome. So I wrote a tiny little piece of it. Yeah, I was super impressed by that because uh, it's a really great book. And Jay is starting an editing agency. Are, are we allowed to say that? Am I allowed yeah, to say I that? Yeah, I guess we it's did now. now. I don't edit, so it's too late. 
yeah so um and he invited 13 of us there to uh go through a certification process learn the three-story method story diagnostic editing process uh and um i thought it was i thought it was amazing it was really yeah. great um yeah what were y'all's thoughts oh i i had such a good time you know uh, JP and I use three-story method on the writer's section of our podcast because we think it's a really great way, you know, to look at scenes, to give a common language so everyone knows what we're talking about. And we can kind of say, these are the things that we would see using three-story method. How did you go about constructing this and, and really dig down into the writer process? And I use it in my own scenes. So I use it when I'm writing in Scrivener. I put all the three C's in the right-hand column and some other things. So I have been using it for a long time. So I really enjoyed learning how to use it to help uh, with diagnostics for other people. And actually uh, we're using it in my, my in real life writers group too, because we really like one of the girls in there is a, a story grid editor too. So she's like, we should use that for our writers group. So we're using that, it's amazing. So I'm really excited to be able to offer that to uh, other writers so that we have a common language about these are the things that I see in the story and why and so that it's just really clear and not just like oh your character felt flat or I didn't think this was logical and you know what because what do you do with that so I thought that the way that Jay broke it down it was just really really clear for me how to communicate uh, what I was seeing in a story to help other people make their story better so I just loved it yeah, and then yeah. there's community which I know JP is always a big proponent of community. So that- I of- am, it's a yeah. problem or it's not a problem, <laughs> but I don't think it's a problem. Um, it's funny because uh, three story method, I knew it when it was story levels. Uh, so did Christine. Yes, I did, uh, yeah. We were introduced it in uh, in 2019 at Rockapock and uh, we created stories in it. And that was like my first short story that was published was using story levels. Uh, and so I've been like with three story method for very early. And I had like immediately clung on to it. Uh, so I was using different methods before. Then I met a writing community and I was like, oh, I can talk story structure. And it's so easy when we have the same language. And so it has been fantastic these past few years. And then finally full circle being able to kind of express that in a, a certified way so that we all share the same way that we teach as well. Yeah, and it, just to fill in, um because we're using insider language a little bit. So just to fill in for people who are listening, the three C's are conflict choices and consequences. So three story method lays out that every scene needs to have those three C's and your story also needs to have those three C's on multiple levels. So there needs to be local and global three C's. Um, And it allows you not just to lay out a plot, but kind of analyze a plot uh, in your own writing. I know I started, I didn't use it. I didn't know about it until they published the book. Uh, And I started using it. I've used a ton of different methods. I started off with save the cat um, and Mm -hmm. obsessively had these like spreadsheets that like had save the cat, which was before save the cat writes a novel. I took save the cat screenwriting. Yeah, I did too. I did too, Jeff. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And that was um, for my first three novels was great, but just became very limiting as I moved into novel four. Novel four, I had um seven points of view (laughs) which man uh it was moving uh so um it was a lot uh yeah but they all have unique voices um so that uh three save the cat just wasn't helpful uh for that so i switched to story grid and um the like one of the final chapters in story grid where they talk about like the five components of a scene that was helpful but the rest of the book was um not so helpful for me personally i know some people love it but for me i just couldn't connect with it i felt it very um restricting and very like uh complicated i was like i mm-hmm. i need you know writing is hard enough as it is when i sit down to write i just need something easy so uh the three-story method was that like something easy for me it was like oh this is super easy to grasp onto i just have to remember that i need three c's and when i get stuck in a scene a lot of times i'm like all right somebody needs to make some choices (laughs) (laughs) so yeah it's just a it's an easy lingo um part of what we did there that i really loved and i'm just gonna pump you two up for a minute um is 
Jay has this, uh, he's built this story rubric. Um, rubric as in like, if you're a teacher and you're like, hey, here's what I'm going to be grading my class on. Uh, and it lays out, I don't know how many components are in it. 12 or 13 Ooh, uh, quite a few yeah. yeah quite a few i'll put it i'll put a link to it in the show notes um because he did put it under creative commons so it's free for anybody to use and uh create new versions of or whatever you want to do with it so jay's has this form of editing he calls the story diagnostic where he takes a story and for each chapter he does a like three story method analysis of the chapter it's like how is this how are the three c's here how's your characterization here's things that i'd change here's what's going really well and then after that he does um at the end of the story he does he gives you a big like analysis on the rubric and that's what we all got trained in yeah. um and so you are both are jp already is has his flag up um taking editing clients and christine you are um on your way to taking editing clients i will be taking editing clients i'm just a little uh, slammed at the moment but it will yeah, be coming but it's coming it's coming very soon and you're both fantastic writers so i highly recommend both of you as editors and i'm i'm started this week taking editing clients um uh, both in the story diagnostic and then under developmental edit, which I'm going to bring Laura. Laura Hum, my partner in Dialogue Doctor, is also taking editing clients. She's just doing developmental edits, which are line by line edits where, like, we're cutting and chopping words. But I'm also doing some story diagnostic clients. I'm going to take one a month. Um, so all that to say, I, I was, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the system. I was really excited by it. I've never. <laughs> Laura is actually the only editor I've ever used, which is a weird, that's not totally true. I used um, another woman who was fantastic, um, who gave me more of kind of a proofread edit than like a, a real edit, um, than like a developmental edit. So this kind of like story diagnostic where somebody like takes the story and analyzes it for you without the like line by line chopping, because the line by line chopping that developmental edit, if you're not emotionally prepared for that, mm -hmm. it's um, it can be overwhelming, uh, especially mm -hmm. when Laura and I do it. Like, you know, I just do chapters for people, typically. This will be the first time I've ever opened it up to take a full book, and I'll give people their chapter back, and uh, th they need a minute <laughs> <laughs> to be like, what just happened to my chapter? Um, so this story diagnostic, um, for me, I was excited about because I was like, oh, this is a really great way to help an author mm -hmm. understand their story and where they need to rewrite without getting like tangled in the weeds of every sentence, every punctuation mark. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. And you know, uh, when you think you've only had one editor, I've had um, a couple editors and actually one of them was Jay Thorne. And he always says, you know, my job is to put me out of a job. And honestly, after he went through a manuscript with me, I was kind of like, I don't need you now. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that explained, because he was so good. I'm like, I get everything you're telling me. And yeah, I'm, I'm good. And I'd had uh, one before that I'd had a line edit and it was a fantastic line edit. And it improved the manuscript, but it didn't improve me as a writer, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Makes the manuscript sense, yeah. was much better after the line edit. I was not a better writer. Mm -hmm. After I had worked with Jay, and I was one of his first clients um, before he had even done three, three story method, you know, so we were just going through like scene level analysis. And I learned so much about structure. I'm like, I'm good now. Thanks. And I think the difference is um, it, it's improving the writer, it's improving the story. And what do readers care about? They care about the story. You can have the most beautifully written prose, and if it's not a good story, they don't care. And on the other side, you look at stories where maybe they need a line edit, but the story is great uh, and they sell. Like, I mean, I felt that way kind of about Twilight. I read it and I was like, oh my goodness, not like it was not a bad story, but like this thing could use a line edit. There's a lot of L-Y words in here, but it was a great story. I give her props for that. I'm like, you wrote a great story and you sold a whole bunch of copies. So the thing that I, I like about the diagnostic was it's like, we're going to improve your writing. We're going to make sure your story is good. So... I mean, when you have a story that's working at a global level, readers are happy. That's what it's yeah. about, right? You yeah, know? I always find it funny that like as writers, we're always like, 
you know, like, oh, Fifty Shades of Grey is so poorly written. But like, readers don't care. <laughs> I don't care. The story like, is great. They love this. They love the story. They love the like choices the characters are making. They love. They're into the thing. Yeah. And so, like, if the if it's not this like artful, beautiful, you know, prose with like stunning dialogue, because the dialogue in that book is rough. If it's not, <laughs> it's not the like, <laughs> you know, artful, beautiful prose and like amazing dialogue. Readers are like the story will save it. Like getting me into the story. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Sex and vampires helps too. Well, they, that does too. But I, I do think like with the three C's when, you know, if you get that part down, it fixes a lot of problems globally and on the scene level, because the three C's are not just about, you know, scene construction. They're also about character. If you're thinking about character, you know, you get to know a character, not by talking about a character saying, Hey, that is a depressed character. You know, you get to know the character by the character's actions and actions are decisions actions are choice and then how they go on to the next scene from their consequence so I really felt like it just brings everything together if you can do the scene level and the global level you get consistent characters and the story as a whole just elevates so yeah it was great yeah one thing I love about the story rubric um, being both a client who has received the story rubric and giving it to clients is that it gives you all of the different aspects of writing and it puts you on a scale that both shows you ways of improving, but also what you're good at. And having been um, like getting a editing and not having that and just being shown what to fix is overwhelming. It, yeah. It's just like, oh, I'm just a terrible writer. Like my manuscript is crap and I just have to fix all of this. But knowing that, man, this editor noted that my pacing was great. You know, I'm hitting all of those beats, but maybe my characterization needs a little fine tuning. Maybe I need to figure out what my core story is, what my theme is, and that will drive it. But for pacing, ooh, I'm perfect. And knowing that rises up that um, the client or, you know, it, it made me feel great because then I'm like, okay, I know that I'm good at this. I know that I can own this, but I know that I need to focus over here. So that's why I love the rubric personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I'll drop it in the, in the show notes. So everybody can go see it because the rubric's fantastic. And um, I also both highly recommend you guys as editors. So JP, where can people find you to uh, hire you as an editor? Well, I have such a weird name. Uh, so JP Rindflesh IX. IX because I'm the ninth and Rindflesh is R-I-N-D-F-L-E-I-S-C-H. If you can spell Fleshman's vodka, you can spell <laughs> Rindflesh. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um yeah so um go find jp uh he's great i'm i'm gonna just take one client a month um if i get so but uh you can find my stuff on dialogdoctor.com i'm over there uh again laura is also taking developmental edits um if you want the like deep dive into your stuff uh laura's doing that uh christine where where can we find you as an editor when she Christine did Daigle out. Books. Yeah, it's christinedaigle.books.com. That's nice. pretty easy. Daigle, okay. D-A-I-G-L-E. Now let's totally shift topics and let's talk serial fiction. Um, let's do it. Yeah, and part of the reason I was really pumped, I mean, I wanted to bring y'all on after hanging out with you in Cleveland because you're both amazing and it's fun. Uh, but also- It was the bourbon, wasn't it? Uh, it was the bourbon. So can I tell that story? I'm going to tell <laughs> oh, that story. Oh, you sure can. <laughs> so we were all at the, uh, wait, the Career Author Summit. Is that what it was called? Oh, yeah, that was in Nashville. I forgot. We've Nashville. hung out so many places now. I, I forget where we hang out. <laughs> so we've hung out <laughs> twice. Were both of those in the month of October? No. No, September. One was in September, one was in October. So in September, we were in Nashville together at the Career Author Summit. And then we were in Cleveland together. But at the Career Author Summit, we recorded an episode of Serial Fiction Podcast. And um, <laughs> Christine, your amazing husband was there. <laughs> and you, you were like, he was like, oh, I'm going to go get. I'm like, people are coming to the room. He's like, okay. Yeah. I'm going to go get something to drink, like, so that, like, people can, like, hang out in the room and, you know, we can have, like, a party as we're recording this podcast, which I thought was funny because I knew when I was showing up, like, oh, we're going to record for, like, 45 minutes and then I'm going to go to bed because I've been around <laughs> people all day. I'm a crazy introvert. Like, you know, I, I do well with people. Like, I'm not the kind of introvert that I like, can't talk to people. I do okay with people, but, man, it wears me out. And when it's done, I'm, like, ready to crash. So... <laughs> We, um, we, he comes into the room while we're recording 
and he had like five bottles of bourbon it was awesome he was like, like i thought you were having people in the room i'm like no just jamie and jack recording a podcast <laughs> man he came to party he was ready to like he was good he was ready to go he was gonna tie one on uh yeah <laughs> um i don't actually know if that's the expression it may not be anyway that was fun so um yeah anyway i wanted to talk about serial fiction with y'all um because i'm finding it's changing my writing um and it's it's also changing how i approach dialogue so i wanted to just um explore it with the experts a little bit to talk about it some so talk to me a little bit about um what is serial fiction for those who who are listening who don't know Jake both just, me, so I both just gave me. me a face like uh, what did you just uh, ask me to like I think we're just looking at each other yeah I'm trying to see who's gonna go so serial fiction is uh generally long form fiction so you're intending to write it for a long time serial fiction in some of its iterations have serials that are thousands of episodes long now you don't have to do that but the intention is to have it as kind of an open-ended story you can write it as long as you feel like it. Uh, so, you know, it gives you a bit more freedom than, than writing a novel or whatever, because you can take it in different directions. You can do different arcs, different storylines. You can, you know, explore different characters. So it's a bit of a broader um, platform for fiction. And it is usually uh, part of the fun of it is having audience participation. So you are immediately interacting with your audience and they're telling you what they like and what they don't like and what their hopes are, dreams are, and you're kind of gearing your writing towards that. So that's kind of the idea of serial, serial fiction in general. And yeah. you get the audience participation because while it's this long form, it goes on forever and ever, you tend to publish short episodes of it and you right. publish them quickly. So like mm -hmm. daily, unless you have a anchor drag down of a partner like me, who's like, I won't do more than one a week. Um, so daily, or if you're, if you're suffering as JP is suffering weekly with a curmudgeon like myself, suffering. yeah, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So you get that quick author, um, you get that quick feedback right away mm -hmm. from it. Um, so how do you feel, uh, well, let me ask first, sorry, I'm ordering with the questions. I sent you guys questions earlier and JP sent back some and I'm already going to change them a little bit. That's okay. Um, he prepped and I didn't, so. <laughs> so <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> um, I will not be constrained by my own rules. Um, so how do you feel about that like long arc plot? What do you like about it? What do you hate about it? So I grew up, uh, watching like anime and reading manga because I'm that person. Um, and I love that form of fiction where I can like go with characters and I can see these little mini arcs and know that I can be with them week after week and I can always come back to these characters. And, you know, when you're talking about shows like Naruto and Bleach, like those are hundreds and hundreds of episodes long. And I know those characters because I have spent time with them. So how do I feel about like long fiction? It's great. It, uh, it's a really fun way to approach story without being constrained by how many pages you need to have for, you know, a series or even how many pages you need to have in order to complete one book and get to the next one, quote unquote, because you don't, you can just keep on going and there isn't necessarily, um, that need to constrain your plot. You can always continue with loops and open loops and leave them open and come back to them later based off of audience want. Yeah, same. And I, you know, I was a big comics fan before this. So it's the same kind of idea. You can get the little issues that then go to these volumes or omnibuses or whatever. Uh, and it's the same kind of idea. You get these mini stories inside this, this big overarching arc. I'm a fan of that style of storytelling. I think it's really fun. Yeah, I think it demands, part of what I'm finding is that it really demands big characters mm -hmm. um, because the character interaction has to hook the reader with each chapter. We're like, you know, if you're in a novel and you're reading, you're reading a novel and you can kind of look at like, okay, 
well, this chapter, I, I just have to power through this one and then I'll get to the next one. And I'm kind of following the, the arc of the book and I can see kind of a little bit where it's going and like where it's happening. I'm finding with serial fiction as I write it and read it for the first time, it is like those anime and those comic books in that like what drives you coming back is your engagement with those characters, right? Like my, my teenage son, I'm way too old for Naruto. I'm so old. Uh, but my teenage son loves naruto and it you know they dress like the characters at halloween like yeah they, they he runs around like that um <laughs> the, the weird like arms stretched back face leaning forward which i know is like their fast ninja run but i'm like that's the most ineffective you know aggressive run ever it's aerodynamic yeah someone is gonna punch you right in the face uh so <laughs> But yeah, they do that. Uh, but it is the like character journeys that they're really there for. They're there to see the characters each week. And I remember when I was reading comic books as a kid, it was like, oh, I I am into this specific character. Like I collected all of the comic books of this character because I loved that individual character, right? Like, and so I'm finding that characterization is super important mm -hmm. for these serial things. Yeah. And, and, you know, talking to people who have been doing it a long time, much longer than I have, um, something that I've heard over and over again from different serial fiction authors is that plot is not that important, but you need to have a little bit of it because it is very character driven. So if you're a 100% pantser, you're going to struggle. But if you're a detailed plotter, you're also going to struggle. So you kind of have to have a hybrid where you know where you're starting and where you're ending. But all, you know, you're kind of pantsing all those episodes in the middle and it's all character driven, which I thought was really interesting. So I have been keeping that in mind for all the, the arcs of my serials is that, okay, I have an end goal in mind. When I'm ready to, uh, to wrap up those serials, this is what's going to happen. But then there's all kinds of different mini stories and different arcs that are happening on the way to that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And I mean, Jeff, we, we based ours basically off of the office like we wanted those types of characters because that's the character driven story that we went off of and i mean even if you look at serials in the term of like sitcoms though sitcoms are driven by character you know week after week the plot is entirely different sometimes they don't even change that much as a character by the end of it because it's really the journey of that episode and it's kind of like you want to feel that character in that moment and the plot is it's just there it does remind me a lot of like you know all of those great tv shows that like we grew up on like you know the and i think streaming has changed this a little bit because i feel like with streaming things have become far more plot driven now because you have like a nine episode arc they've kind of like taken the plot focus of a movie and put it into a more serialized well, that's the wrong use of serialization. I promised myself I would only use the word serial in one way on this podcast, <laughs> and I've already broken that promise to myself. Um, they've taken that like movie plot form and put it into uh, a more like not weekly format, but smaller chunk format. But I feel like if you you know if you rewind like five years, those things on network television, this the shows on network television that we love, like Law and Order, that everybody was hugely addicted to or i know my mom is huge into ncis uh, you know those crime dramas that are really about like watching these personalities solve the crime of the week where you have the, all the comedies like the office and parks and rec and brooklyn 99 where it's like you know where's this plot going eh, it doesn't really matter it's really just about like you know watching dwight and jim like screw around in the office and have a good time yeah yeah so talk to me about your process jp i'll let you describe our process because i i talk enough on this podcast um so <laughs> talk to me about christine uh, we'll start with you talk about your process you've got two serials going mm -hmm. and i know the one i'm reading is at 39 episodes it is uh, which i'm i'm trying to catch up on i'm so slow <laughs> uh yeah so talk to us about how what your process is for both ones are they different or you have the same process it's, it's the same process uh, i have a, a co-author we outline loosely. Here's our, our theme. Here's our beginning point and our ending point. And then one of us first drafts and then the other one comes in and the other one looks at it. And, 
you know, uh, initially we had like alpha readers and beta readers and a proofer. It's been hard to sustain. So now it's just kind of like beta reader and I proof it myself. <laughs> and that's about it. Nice. So it's, it's going pretty quickly because we're doing two episodes a week right now for both serials. So it's four episodes a week that we're dropping, which is a lot. And we're going to maintain that at least through the end of the year. Um, we may maintain it indefinitely. I don't know. We're definitely going to keep with Molecule Thief doing at least two a week and the horror two a week, if not one. So yeah, we're just writing daily and just shooting things back and forth. I mean, they're quick, right? You're writing like 1500 words, maybe 2000 at the most. So it doesn't take a lot. And, you know, I, li I like the pressure. Like I like the, the pressure of it. We've got these deadlines. We've got to get it out, you know. We have a couple super fans who message us on Instagram. So we got to keep them happy and keep these That's things awesome. coming out. <laughs> I love that. I love that you have fans. What kind of uh, interaction are you getting with fans? They just like they just send messages about things that they like and things that they thought were cool in the serial, which is which is awesome. They're That's like, oh, I love cool. this part and I love this and this is cool. And I'm like, That's good. We don't have many of them, but we appreciate the ones we have. That's awesome. Yeah. It's very cool. Uh JP, um, you want to talk about our process? Yeah. Sorry, I'm laughing you. because Christine was like, it's only 1,500 words. It's like, unless you have Jeff as your partner, then you're getting like 2,800 word first drafts. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, so on the plus side, I, I really like that we release one episode a week with that slightly longer uh, episode because yeah. that gives our readers a little bit more to chew on and, and hold out on. Um, but I think, so our process is I plot <laughs> and then... I hand it over to Jeff, but right now, I think last two weeks ago was about the time where we reached episode 13, I want to say, and I felt really comfortable finally plotting everything that was in between. We had kind of this world building conversation there, but you know, I, I wanted to wait until we were in the groove before we got what we call consider season one uh, completed. And so, you know, we started to have some some conversation. Okay, well, who is our, our big bad for season one? And I was able to plot out about 70-ish episodes, uh, including holiday specials, when we finally decided to toss those in, yeah. um, which is Listening, fun. Shout I out to it. Stephanie Bond, listening to Stephanie Bond, who we, we met at the uh, Career Author Summit, uh, who is the master of serial fiction. If you're interested in what it looks like, um, she's doing uh, Elevator Girl right now, which is amazing. Uh, I've been reading along with it. She goes every day, mm -hmm. uh, which is, it's wild. And it's, she's a great writer. It's a great story. Um, anyway, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you. that was perfect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, scene wise, I, I'll plot it out and I'll, I'll toss in the, the three C's before I send it over to you, Jeff, and then you first draft. Um, and then I'll look it over and I'll kind of look for the voice and, you know, I might, I try not to touch a lot of the dialogue doctor's do dialogue because I get nervous, Whatever. but then I do it anyway. Um, being able to but, talk about it and being able to do it are two completely different things. <laughs> being able to see it in somebody else's work and being able to pull it off in your own work, two totally different, two totally I different skill sets. the fun part about us is you, you know characters super well. And I think that I have like the the ability to kind of flesh out the world around them a little bit more. Yeah, you're great and so, with the plot you know, the world. With our powers combined, yeah. we make nerds happen. <laughs> Wonder twins combined, create nerds. Um, so yeah, I think, um, and I love how you plot. So I'm just gonna talk about that for a second because as a as a writer, it's really helpful. I've gone the gamut from like man, I'm going to take, like back when I was doing Save the Cat, it was like, okay, I need every scene. I need every scene to match this like plot structure. Um, there's actually a, a Google sheet I made for the right practice that's like floating out there somewhere. You can probably go find it. It's people still like go get it and download it. But it's just like a Google sheet that like had every beat of the story in it. Um, and it, back then I was a really heavy plotter. When I moved to writing mysteries supernatural mysteries with my latest series i became more of a like half pantser half plotter where i was like okay i kind of need to know where this is going but and i need to kind of know like what's starting each scene but then i'm just gonna write and see what happens um 
So I love the way you're plotting because you're, you're laying out for me in a spreadsheet. Like, you know, here's the, here's the three C like, here's the summary of what needs to happen in the scene. This is, this, these, these are the plot points, Jeff, you have to hit. Um, and then you're like, here's the conflict choice and consequences. Um, and if I have those three C's, I'm, I'm kind of good to go. Like I can just grab it and roll out a scene uh, pretty quick. It takes me about an hour and a half. It's nice to just be able to roll through it. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate the plotting that you do. It's great. And I, I love, you know, just encouragement working with a partner. I, I, Christine, I don't know how you feel about this, but I love the fact that I only have to worry about one thing. Oh I yeah. Have to worry it's about the, it's first the same. Round. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. We worry about different things. And uh, yeah, three C's, uh, you know, I use them in my scenes and we used a uh, three story method for our story, our outlines, the 12 beats. So, I mean, it's easy, right? You know, you've got it down. Here's where we're going. It's yeah. a loose outline, but you've got, you know, those are for each uh, season arc. That's what we're using. And it makes it really easy. Yeah, I will say it was weird catching the character voice, voices. Um, that took JV, I feel like that took you and I some negotiation of like, how does this character sound kind of just a, a need to like agree on it. And mostly because there were two characters that I just did not have. I did not have their voice. I couldn't figure it out. One of them was coming off really mean. <laughs> and you're like sarcastic, not mean. I was like, all right, let me try again. It's like, no, it's just mean. Uh, and really grumpy. I write grumpy people really well. So one of them was coming off. We already have a grumpy character. So then like I, we had two grumpy characters and they were like grumpy twins. And it's like not <laughs> funny. Um, like the office isn't funny if there's two Dwights running around the office. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, we had to do some negotiation around character voice, which was, I think it took us about 10 episodes, 11 episodes to finally land. Yeah. yeah, I think for those characters, which they weren't the forefront, but, you know, they were starting to to shine a little bit. And we were like, oh, to clean that a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> of course, we... now that they have their voice, I want to work them into more scenes. <laughs> right? They're, They're like, fun. oh, I really like them. Yeah, let's get them into more. Yeah. Um, so how has this, how has moving from JP moving from short stories to serial and Christine moving from you know, novels to serial, how has this changed your uh, writing style? It, it's changed it quite a bit, uh, actually, because I think more about the scene being tight, like you have to be tighter. I think a lot about beginning lines of each scene. And I think a lot about the ending few lines or paragraph of each scene. Um, Cause you have to keep readers moving to the next episode right it's not like if they bought a book and the writing's pretty good they're gonna you know read the next chapter because they've already bought the book with the serials they're paying by episode so you really have to think about how you're beginning and ending each episode and uh, trying to end with some you know started off some kind of hooky first line and trying to end with some kind of visually or emotionally uh I guess uh, we JP was just talking about that take off your pants book on your other podcast. They call it the symbol crash. You're trying to end with a visual bang at the end of your scene so that your reader's thinking about it. So that if your next episode doesn't drop for a day or two days or a week, um, they're coming back because they're still thinking about it. So I really think about tight beginnings and endings of scenes a lot more than I did. And I've learned a lot of things that I probably would have changed in some of my original scenes if I knew then what I knew now, but <laughs> you know, it's cool. It's a, it's fun. Yeah. yeah. And JP, I'm sorry. We totally neglected to mention that you and Chris Kane also do the right away podcast. I feel like, I feel like a bad yes. host. Right away podcast.com. Yeah. A great, great podcast. And that's W R I T E space away podcast. Yeah. Um, sorry, Christine did throw that in there, but yeah yeah oh, you gotta plug that podcast it's a i know podcast. it's a great podcast it's that fantastic. was my book suggestion and they did it so you should go to listen to them talk to them about awesome. it because it's cool yeah. yeah it is really good um jp uh what about you has it changed your writing style any yeah definitely so i i write a lot visually speaking so i will generally use like a narrator's voice to lay of the land and describe things i'm very 
I come from the epic fantasy world. That's my life. So that's what I'm used to. And I did this in my short stories and I was even doing it in the the series that I'm working on with A.B. Cohen. And now working on serials, I see that a lot of that needs to be condensed and it needs to be in dialogue or in paragraphs that are two to three sentences at max. And it's really helped me hone in and make those sorts of sentence structures and word choices that are more simplistic, but yet still hold that complexity or that uniqueness that I like. Um, And so for me, it's personally like changed the way that my character voice or my own like voice comes out on the page because I like to be weird. I like to use weird words, but being able to hone that in so that it's not just dragging on or, or describing, which is fantastic in epic fantasy. It is not in serial. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that, but it's super true. You just don't have space for the big, like paragraph long descriptions. They just don't, it doesn't fit. Yeah. yeah. No, you can't. Be I mean, because for, for serials, <laughs> three pages, <laughs> right. For serials, you're reading it on a phone. And, you know, if you have more than three sentences, it's more than likely that you're going to get a wall of text. Yep. So you have to think about what the reader is seeing in your writing. So you have to think about how can you break up your what you're describing and put it into smaller chunks. Yeah, you have to think about that white space. Like I preview it to see what it looks like to make sure there's not a wall of text because that's like a psychological barrier. If you just see a wall of text on your phone, yeah. nobody wants to read that. So yeah. Yeah, I talk all the time on this podcast about how like if you give readers, even in a novel, and, and I think I was talking to somebody recently about whether or not this is new or old. Um, and I really think it's something that we're, that's new as we like look at uh, different, um, different, like as I go back and read classics, they have more wall of text, right? Like, especially if we're reading like Les Mis or like the Three Musketeers, there's like a whole chapter of just paragraphs about the curtains. Uh, so they seem to get away with it more. I think part of it has to do with our attention span becoming smaller as we like, go more and more into visual media that like we're losing that i'm not sad about it we're losing the like you know give me the details of the curtains and we're mm-hmm. into more like i just i want to engage with the characters directly um yeah so anyway i think that's i think that's an interesting observation with serial fiction i hadn't really thought about it that like because people are reading it on their phones if you give them a paragraph they're just have like a giant wall of wall of text that's like uh what am i what's happening uh i think for me i i um i've had to go much bigger with my voices which has been interesting i didn't realize at first that like when i it's something i've discovered about my own writing writing serial fiction is that in my novels i've got you know i stay with like characters over most of my novels are about 60 to 80,000 words. So I have like 60 to 80,000 words to help you get to know like th- three characters usually. Like there's usually three main characters that you're like following around in my novels. Um besides that one I mentioned earlier where there's seven, but there's usually three. Uh and I can take my time like giving you insight into who they are and helping you like get comfortable with them and helping you like discover their wound and like watch that wound play out but just knowing that like oh i might only have two thousand words with this reader that may be it like i don't have the time for that kind of nuanced character development so i'm finding that you know i have to go big immediately with a character voice like the character has to be larger than i'd write in a novel it's got to be louder it's got to be everything feels exaggerated so like our lead character for example is ethan and he's very he's a rookie he's very naive he's very um uh asks a ton of questions right like if i was doing his voice chart i'd be like well under words and topics everything's a question um everything is is a naive observation and then his body language is also very like 
closed and defensive a lot. Like he does a lot of like looking down, a lot of putting his hands in his pockets because he's unsure of himself all the time. Uh, his cadence, he tends to like speak in one sentence, um, maybe like two, never a paragraph, right? Like he just like throws out a couple sentences here and there. And then his pacing, he interrupts conversations with his questions, right? Like that's how he operates in pacing. He he, he hates silence. So if there's ever silence, Ethan's going to talk. So that's um, that's like how we've worked his voice. And I realized after the first three episodes, I was like, I don't have time to like play around with silence in his voice. Like, so I need to up the questions tenfold. Like it's gotta be big. Cause I gotta get a reader every episode. They gotta be like, Oh, I know exactly who Ethan is. Um, it, and it does remind me a lot of like, we were talking about sitcoms. It reminds me a lot of like a Brooklyn nine, nine or an office or like, you know, you have some nuanced characterization in those shows, but for the most part, characters are big and they come in big and they come in loud and they kind of have their gimmick and you watch their gimmick. And only after you've like really digested their gimmick and fallen in love with it, can you really do the nuanced character work that a novel tends to allow off the bat. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's, that's how it's pushed my, uh, my writing style some. Um, how much of that are y'all carrying over into your novels and uh, short story work? That's a good question because I haven't had time to work on anything. <laughs> you're, you're, doing, you're doing four episodes a week. <laughs> yeah, you got time. I had a novel and I was working on it and it kind of stalled out. So, yeah, I don't know yet. I'm going to have to see how that goes. JP? um well I am working on a novel um luckily uh I'm not the first drafter uh because I feel like if I was I would maybe be too too serialized until I I've reached a point where I can see the difference between the two uh so now what I'm doing is I'm looking at the draft and I am considering like white space and how to um make dialogue the the forefront in describing the world um and I, I've always tried to do that, but it, it just makes it uh, all the more fun uh, coming from serials and having to do it this way. Yeah, I think for me, something we didn't talk about, actually, that's changed in my that's carrying over in my writing is writing serials, because like Christine, you were saying that like you got a hook early and then you got to keep them on the hook for the next episode at the beginning and mm -hmm. end. Um, I realized painfully with my novels that. And I think this may be come because I started with short stories that my novels, all the chapters start and end like a short story. Like they all like, here's the opening of the short story. Let's go through the short story. Here's the end of the short story. Um, and I've realized writing serial fiction, like, oh crap, I need to change that. Like I need to have these novels yeah. carry the story through the chapter break into the next chapter. But yeah, anyway, that's something that I've been thinking about. Like, yeah, this is going to change in my writing. Yeah, actually, I've been I'm thinking about that when I get back to the novel. I'm like, I have to look at those beginning and endings of scenes because you don't want any sleepy endings to your chapters because that's where readers put the book down and, and walk away, right? Yeah, so, and I, I think yeah. it's it's like if you're a, all of us, I would call hustlers, which means we all have in my lingo, that means we all have day jobs and we're like, you know, doing this stuff on the fly. Um, so for hustlers, I think this is a specific problem because we tend to write in like 2000 word chunks. So like we get like an hour, we write for like two hours, we knock out 2000 words and then we're like, okay, that feels good. I'll come back to it tomorrow. And I find with my like writing habits, it lends to being like, okay, I finished this scene. I wrapped this scene tomorrow. I'll come back to the next scene. And when I, when I have that day break, I find that like there's a, it shows in my chapter, like it shows yeah. in my chapter work. And I have that happen too. And this is just something when we were in Nashville, um, I was talking to J.D. Barker for a while, who is an excellent human being and very generous with his time and expertise. Yeah, he and was. He talking... loves having breakfast with him. That was crazy. I did have breakfast with him. I was it like, was you're, like a, you're like a big selling, huge New York Times number one best selling author all the time writing with Robert Patterson. And you're going to let me sit down next to you at breakfast? This is yeah. crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That was cool. I was like, yeah, we're just having breakfast with J.D. Burger. But the one thing that he I told me. I felt the same me, way by Stephanie Bond, too, because we mentioned her earlier. I oh, was yeah. like, you're like, you know, million dollar author, 
you're just gonna like let me hang out with you in the back of the room like how does that work anyway yeah. <laughs> it was totally cool it was so good Super but cool. yeah and so I got, we got to, I got to talk to JD for a bit and I forget if he said this when he was speaking or to me in person but it was really good advice and he talked about how when he was writing and he's going to end for the day he ends in the middle of a sentence mm-hmm. yeah. and I have tried that and as a hustler as a day job person when I come back you just pick it right up because you're in the middle of a huh. sentence and it is such a good trick and I highly recommend that I do it like when I'm getting near the end of a scene or even if I'm middle in the scene I'll just end it right in the middle of the sentence now and you'll just pick it right back up and you can't get boring that way so I think that really works I really love that so thank that's you JD awesome. for that tip <laughs> yeah that's great JD doesn't listen to this no he doesn't <laughs> but maybe someday <laughs> he's too busy cranking out New York Times number one bestsellers um yeah <laughs> I uh, okay so love hate about serial fiction before I wait before I ask this question before I start like asking my final couple questions anything else about serial fiction y'all want to talk about anything we haven't covered that you're like oh let's talk about that I don't know cliffhangers are important I think we kind of already covered that <laughs> yeah and I'm really bad at them JP's great at plotting them and then I erase them when I first draft um yeah, did we finish talking about our process? JP, I, don't know. I first draft. We left it as a cliffhanger. We left it as a cliffhanger. <laughs> Go read notes and week. see if you can figure it out. You won't be able to figure it out. <laughs> JP plots. I write, I first draft, and then JP edits uh, mm-hmm. and makes the first draft palatable. Um, and so that's uh, that's our process. Um, yeah, so I take all the cliffhangers out. I don't like, I can't do it. I end, I end it with like, in scene. And then JP's like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> fix it cliffhanger yeah anyway that's the fun part too about the author notes um because i really like to add in uh that like questioning narrator you know ooh, what's gonna happen to ethan next week you know that kind of thing uh and Me that too. adds to like a uh, author notes cliffhanger yeah yeah, yeah. that's a good um, use and author notes are appearing on vela Mm-hmm. Uh, which is Kendall's new Amazon's new uh, platform for serialized fiction. Where else are y'all putting up serial fiction? Uh, we are both on Fictionate, as you well know, Jeff. We both Fictionate. Have me. Serials on Fictionate. That's me. right. Yeah, which is yeah. a great platform for um, you know, I, I, they're super cheerleaders of, of my work or have been, which yeah, has been you amazing. Blog so, posts and stuff. Love your it. Work. <laughs> Yeah, they did put us on the front page for a little while, which made Yay. me super happy. Yeah. Yeah, it was nice. We're not there anymore, but we were for a while. <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, where else are people, y'all are the serial fiction experts. Where else are people putting up fiction? Serialized oh, fiction. Oh, Radish for Romance, uh, Wattpad, which is free mostly. There are some ways you can be not free. Uh, Royal Road for like sci fi, fantasy, lit RPG. Uh, there are other ways to get into it that i am blanking patreon. on some of them patreon yeah there are um ones where you can write for where you can get into games is it called inkit i think inkit is one of them uh there Wait, are what do you mean get into games so like if you put up on inkit it's i, I believe it's free i'm not in, on inkit so i don't know exactly how it works uh but you put up your fiction and they'll select some of them to put in those games like chapters and things have you seen those interactive like on your phone where it's like do you want to date him? Make All a choice. Those. So they'll make them into those. Uh, Neovel is one. Uh, there are a bunch of places. Fascinating. All yeah. right. Yeah. With- and I, I Thanks for listening to those because I do want people like, if this is something you're thinking about, if you're like, man, I love writing short stories. I, I like novels. The plot of a novel seems impossible to me, but the idea that I can like crank something 1500 words out and post it somewhere and get it get feedback on it pretty quickly once you build a following um i just wanted people to know where they could go yeah research and look at that stuff yeah. novel now i can keep going web teams if you do comics i don't know <laughs> um the big thing though is to always make sure you're reading the contract of wherever service you're going on so like vela yes. we can't put things on wattpad because generally wattpad's free vela's paid service so obviously vela would pull your serial if you popped it onto Wattpad. Uh, we have it on Fictionate because Fictionate, there is a paywall 
that can mimic uh, more or less Vela. And then obviously Patreon is another paywall. So those are like three places you could easily get into with your cereal if you want it paid. Yeah, make sure you read your contract and see what's exclusive, what's not, what you can do and what you can't do on the different platforms. That's awesome. And I do just want to shout out Stephanie Bond's amazing advice at the Career Author Summit was um, don't go to these places, build your own like blog she, what she does her process is she puts up a new one every day a new yeah. um for and she goes i think it was she said eight months she goes straight of the year. Was july to december or something july like to that. december yeah. however many months that is um and she does it because she can hit all the holidays in there she can get like july 4th and thanksgiving and all of that um and christmas she always ends on new year uh so she goes every day and then she rolls out um x number of episodes i can't remember how many she said go into a novella that she then publishes and then after she's got the novellas together for a book she publishes them as a box set so it's brilliant because she's selling the same uh story three different times which i think is and now she's doing audiobooks too so four different times the same story like which is just genius so but she puts it out on her own blog and she only keeps it up for 24 hours and she pulls it down which is how she gets away with selling it um on kdp and posting it for free because she can post it for free on her blog as long as it's under a certain word count so she she gets away with it that way which i think is again freaking genius um so yeah I, i just thought that was really brilliant uh, okay, pros and cons, love, hate. Where are you with serialized fiction? Because you're both very, you're both accomplished writers. You've both written novels. You've both done short form. Like, where are you with that? Uh, how do you feel about serialized fiction? Uh, the same things I love are sometimes the same things I hate. I love the pressure and the deadline, but I also hate the pressure and the deadline. And I love that you just have to get it out there, but I also hate that you can't revise it. So (laughs) it's like the things that I love are also the things that I hate. So I have a love hate relationship with it, but in general, I, I love it. I, I, it's like, it's somewhat liberating because I'm like, you just have to write it. It's out there. You've got your deadline, you do it and you move on. So you can't go back and obsess over it, which I do like to do. And, you know, do like multiple, multiple revisions, draft zero, draft minus one, draft zero, one, two, 20, final, 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 really final this time. You can't do that with serial fiction. And and I like that. It, it's kind of like, I don't know. I feel kind of good about it. Cause it's like, I did it. It's there. You read it. People are reading and responding to it. So you can't get in your own head about it. So I think that's what I love about it the most. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I would say it actually, so as a pro that it did, to the way that I like function is that it improved my editing because I have to be fast. (laughs) I don't have a choice here. Um, And so I learned that I need to read through the whole thing first because one, I didn't write the first draft, so I don't know what it says. And then go in and figure out how to spruce it up and change it and, and alter around and think about the starts and the ends. Now, that's a pro to me. I, I totally like, I can apply that to other things as well. Um, and I would say also the proximity to the reader. Now we haven't had a ton of feedback with nerds, but we have had some, um, you know, it, even just like people sharing when an episode comes out uh, and that happens a lot. Uh, it's fun to be able to see that, you know, other people are like, hey, this came out today and to be like, hey, I'm reading it and I know exactly where they are in the story and I know exactly when they'll get the next piece because it's kind of like I'm sitting next to them and I'm like, oh, just you wait. Um, and that's really fun for me. Uh, I guess cons, you know, I I don't know. It's new to me. It's uh, it's a little different. Um having that deadline and that concern over deadline worries me, but we have such a wonderful buffer, even if we decide to put in a Halloween special out of nowhere and then we have a little bit of a deadline. Um, but yeah, I think I think for now, I don't know if my cons uh, are substantial enough to really even state. Yeah, the, the Halloween special was funny and I'm just gonna share that story real quick. We were looking at our calendar and I, I know I had this revelation. I'm pretty sure you did too, which was like, oh crap, we're writing a ghost story 
and we don't have anything specific for Halloween. <laughs> so it's like, oh, damn it. So we we threw together, we threw two episodes into the midst of our uh, plot line for a special Halloween episode, which will come out. I'm going to post this podcast on Monday. So that'll come out this week. So if you want to read Yay. our two, we're dropping two episodes this week. Two parter. Two parter. Go read it. It's fun. And we did the whole like, what's if we continue to do this for more than one season what's something that we could bring back every halloween we're like we're gonna drop a fun thing that can be a reoccurring theme uh yeah christine were you gonna say something no but i'm okay. reading nerds i'm only on i'm on episode eight though so don't spoil it for me i won't spoil it for you okay um <laughs> yeah so i think for me uh yeah, I don't know that JP, you and I haven't even talked about this. I was in a real slump um, fiction writing during COVID. It was tough. I was working on a book that's like very personally emotional um, and uh, was really emotionally difficult to write. And I had my kids at home with me all the time. I was never alone. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a six on the Enneagram. I'm a big like worrier. I have a lot of like, internal anxiety that I do my best to hide and don't always do and so um I was you know imagining the end of the world and thinking that I needed like stock canned goods especially when COVID first started so what I love I I'm a very methodical writer like I do the same thing every night um I sit down and do my thing and uh so I love I needed and loved the method of it of like okay I do this on Tuesday night. I drew a first draft on Tuesday night and send it to JP. And I, I know there's a lot of comfort in that like routine for me. Um, and it really did bring me out of my slump for fiction, for like being able to like know that like, okay, on Tuesday, I'm going to write something that's like stupid fun and not at all serious and doesn't deal with like, the novel that I'm writing doesn't do with like sexual assault and deconstruction hierarchy. And like, you know, it's like, okay, I can just like have a good time and write about drunk Ethan, uh, which is my favorite Ethan so far. And that's episode 13 and 14, uh, which is coming in like four weeks. But yeah, drunk Ethan, like running around being, uh, being crazy. So anyway, that's been the pro for me is I really like the, the, the method of it. Um, I think if we were trying to do every day, I'd go nuts. Uh, I would, I would need to get like 60 in the can before we went every day. Uh, I don't think I could pull that off. Um, unless I was writing full-time, if I was writing full-time, I'd totally do it every day. Mm -hmm. So if you go by nerd, if you want Jeff and JP to write full-time, go spend <laughs> money on nerds. <laughs> we will write full-time. You'll get an episode every day. Uh, but yeah, so that's been the pro for me. I don't know if I have a con. Um, I do have some cons that like are unrealized fears of like what happens if like my method falls apart and I run out of, I have a real fear of running out of banked episodes, like episodes that we have in the can. I have a genuine terror of like what happens if I'm having to draft on Tuesday, what goes out on Thursday. That freaks the crap out of me. So I think I'm going to hop in there then yeah, yeah. so that you can stop being all nervous. You tell me, because that's why you have a co-writer and I then I write the first draft. Yeah. <laughs> Jiffy, save You've it. done it before. Oh, save it. That's true. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's, those are my, my love and hate of it. But yeah, I could, I mean, yeah. you know, I could keep going with this forever. I'm already planning other, I've got a dream of a Stephanie Bond-esque serialized fiction that I do every day. Cool. that's like 600 words that's it's something okay this is just a crazy story we have time right there's no time limit y'all are stuck limit. on here until i hang up you can't leave um <laughs> you're trapped in my world now uh so, so i probably should share that so i'm sharing it anyway i was it was my first year as a writer ever like i was writing my first book and i got a job my first novel and I got a job working at the company I work at now, just as like a low level writer at the, at the thing. And I'm working across from this guy who will re remain nameless, who um, was uh, like had an MFA, was a very accomplished writer and was always, he seemed always very confused as to why I was hired for the same job he was. In fact, one time he was sitting across from me and he called me a Muppet. 
<laughs> um, and I took it as a compliment. And I was like, which one? <laughs> Like, yeah. was it Fozzie or Grover? I was like, I don't want to be Grover. Um, so, but I'm probably most like Grover. So, and he just kind of shook his head at me. And later, I I realized that he meant that like the the management had their hand up my ass and was like a joke. <laughs> but, but at the time, I thought he was complimenting. He was like, I love the moments. Uh, so, <laughs> so, anyway, he and I talked about writing a um, a uh, book about a guy who shows up to work every day um, who uh, is like in love with somebody in the office and like can't bring up the courage to face them and like is also like but the office is like closing down so he's like got a time limit on it he's like I gotta do this by the time the office closes down and it's one of those where like we're going like very like um, office space where like he doesn't actually know what the company does he just shows up every day to his job where he doesn't know what's going on so I was really excited about writing that and then we never got around to doing anything with it but i can totally see how that would work as like a daily journal for a serialized fiction thing so i'm, I'm thinking about that i think that would be fun that would be fun yeah so i might will I'm, there be destroying of uh copy or fax machines and oh my gosh i hope so yeah <laughs> it'd be great there better be yeah Flare. okay last question if somebody's debating if they're like, okay, my novel is, if let's say that somebody's in the place where I was, where they're like, my novel is is a dirge right now. It's like a, a struggling um, pain in my ass. Um, and I'm looking to change something. And this serialized stuff sounds pretty good. Is it worth it? I think so. My only um, caution would be to make sure you have a backlog of episodes before you get started. How many? Uh, putting it. Uh, I think it depends how long you're writing and how often you're going to write, but I would say at least 10. Nice. Yeah. 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 How many, we have seven backlogged. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's fine. Know. We're fine. Yeah. <laughs> JP's like, don't make don't Jeff panic. nervous. Don't make Jeff panic. <laughs> don't make Jeff freak out. <laughs> I meant to start, not as you're going on. I was just like, I would have 10 to start when you start and then you can go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, JP, is it worth it? Okay, so I'm going to preface this with what you said first. You said they're having a novel that is a dirge. Do they go to serial? And I want to push back on that. Yeah. Why is your novel, why is there an issue? Let's talk about that first before we just go into <laughs> jumping the boat and going for serials. You're such so, a good editor and coach. So <laughs> I'm just saying, come over to my editor's page. We'll talk. Um why not? But also, I, that's that's my big thing is like, don't just leave something because of the shiny new object. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I strongly urge you if if you have like this passion project that you're working on and there's an issue there, either sit down and really think about what that issue is or find someone and talk to them about it, um, because I don't want you to just go over to some shiny new object, try it out for a while, and then, you know, it doesn't work for you. If you want to do serials, which is different than I'm having this issue here and I'm going to jump the boat and go do serials, I strongly recommend that you try them out. Uh, it is a fun platform. Uh, it is really cool to be uh, to have that close proximity to readers, to be able to see when people read your serial and to potentially see where people stop reading uh, and take a look at that and see how you could potentially improve that. Uh, there is a strong Kindle Vela community. Uh, we have several discords going where we have lots of conversations uh, about, you know, how we get readers and also just like fun conversations and, you know, some of them a little wild than others, but I think that they're all, it's a really fun community to be in um, if that is something that you want to pursue. Yeah, I'll also add though, as as a as a caution to that, Vela, while Vela's new, and it's always good to get on, on something that's new, and the bonuses Amazon are giving every month are great. It's hard to understand how this is going to be profitable once the bonuses stop. Mm -hmm. It's a weird. I'm watching the like payment thing, and I'm like, you know, Amazon's really great at making money. They're really <laughs> We good at it. I don't. I'm not fully certain how this is going to actually like roll out as like 
a profitable thing after the after they stop the bonuses for authors who are publishing on Vela. And right now, their discoverability on Vela um, is rough. Yeah, that's that's something that I uh, I've been talking with other authors about too. Because if you go to a platform like Radish, um, they have a carousel. So it's just like whoever can be there and then, you know, you have a chance of readers seeing it and it's like equal chance and you can lottery into some promotions. So everyone has an equal chance to get seen. Um, that has not come to Valley yet. I know that people make these suggestions frequently and they do take the feedback. So we have seen things like the new story feature come up and, and some of those kind of things. So I'm always hopeful that, you know, it's still in beta. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that as it keeps going on, they will integrate some of these things like a carousel like more reader comments, you know, hopefully once they open to international readers, we get more yeah. reads, you know? Amazon's betas though. They've, they've had their like <laughs> dashboard beta for like five years. <laughs> That's not true. It's an exaggeration, but it feels true. Yeah. So I don't, I just, I don't want it to sound like, cause we've been very positive about serialized fiction. I don't want it to sound like something you can just jump into and all of a sudden readers are going to be like, I love you. Oh, um, yeah. I think you have to yeah. really check your expectations. And I have talked to people who have been very, very successful on other platforms who it's taken, you know, six months, a year before they start seeing some organic growth. So, yeah, this is not an overnight pop in and, and you know, you're going to get rich. It's mm. you have to be doing it because you like it. You have to be patient. Don't check your KDP dashboard to see how many reads you've had. It could take six months, a year. So you just kind of have to have a lot of belief in yourself, I guess, to just put those out there. So yeah, keep yeah. going. I think too, the part that really sold me on it was that after 30 days of the last episode that you want to package into a novel, you can then package it into a novel um, in, in Kindle Vela at current stance. I don't know if that'll change, but that really sold me on the fact that regardless of where the serialized format goes, being able to kind of have that post by post and hopefully get readers interested in it and then eventually make another product out of that, that, that sounds fantastic to me because then I'll get a different set of readers on that. Yeah, which is something you and I are totally planning to do is package, I don't remember, I think it's the first 13 episodes. Yep. It may be 14 now. Now that, now that yeah, I took one 14, and broke it into two. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. welcome. Uh, so... <laughs> We were we JP crafted a beautiful 13th episode, and then I spent way too long with drunk Ethan. And so it had to be broken into two episodes. So now it's 14. Uh so yeah, we're totally gonna package them as novellas and sell them as novellas. Um Christine, what are you planning to do with your two serials? Well, there's a question. I was planning to put each season into uh ebook and put them on KU or something like that, but I am um, rethinking that after a conversation I had with a friend who does marketing that that may be splitting my audience so I am mm -hmm. as of right now not sure whether I'm just going to continue with um just keeping it in serial or whether I'm going to put it as ebook as well so I'm going to be doing more digging and more thought into that but I know like um I believe Audrey who's number one right now on uh Bella is going to do the ebook, so I'm probably going to watch and see what she does. Yeah, that's smart. She's, she's smarter than me. Yeah. <laughs> Can I quick hype up Christine's amazing serials for Please just a do. Second? Okay, Please do. so yeah. Dark is Away. I just need everyone to know if you liked Hereditary, if you liked The Witch, if you liked Midsummer, just go now. Just leave. <laughs> don't don't leave the podcast. Stay with us until the end. But go check it out because it is like reading one of those just wonderful slow burn horrors and i i love it it's so good so lp styles dark is away um and then molecule thief madness it's just <laughs> madness uh it's super sci-fi it's quantum madness i'm pretty sure christine was like i'm interested in quantum physics let me make a story about this and she did and it's wonderful and beautiful and i feel smarter reading it without even that madness of like i feel like i don't know what i'm reading it's amazing go read it I'll yeah read. it definitely has that andy <laughs> weir feel of like i feel like i'm learning things right now i can survive on mars because of this uh, yeah. fun and fact i minored in physics so yeah 
and the I character did. in Molecule Thief is uh, non-neurotypical, and you do a fantastic job of It's just the inside of my head. I have ADHD, so he also has ADHD. I'm like, welcome to my head. So you'll That's notice right. that Dark is always is only one point of view, and Molecule Thief is four, because I'm like, if I leave you in Spencer's head, the whole time you're going to be exhausted. <laughs> so I had to bring in other characters. Oh, awesome. Welcome. Welcome to inside of my head. <laughs> um okay before we wrap up anything else we want to talk about no oh, no so. all right awesome y'all thank you so much y'all were thanks awesome for having us yeah thank i'm you. gonna i'm gonna stop the recording and we can chat bye. a little more bye you later <laughs>